Well, first of all, thank you very much indeed for coming. Uh, a very warm welcome to you all. I'm sorry about the rather inclement weather. I'm uh, Brian Dorn. I'm the current chairman of the Spey District Salmon Fishery Board. And with me I have Duncan Ferguson, who is our operations manager. And I'm, I'd just like Duncan to just outline exactly what his role is and his responsibilities and the, all of the issues that he's been dealing with over the last year and looking forward to dealing with in the future. Duncan. Uh, well, I kind of look after the whole catchment. We look after a, a, a very large river. It's 112 miles long, long with 560 miles of tributaries. Comes out of 3,000 square kilometres of a catchment. So within that uh, catchment, there's always lots of things to do, whether it's uh, you know working with distillers, working with water abstraction, working with dueling of the A9 just now, lots of bridge culverts and opportunities here to work with the new A9 people to enhance uh, access for fish that's maybe been a bit of a problem in the past. Also quite involved with the uh, habitat enhancement work, so you know, looking at things that were done in the past, rivers that were canalised and work very closely with SEPA and SNH and they, you know, we work closely together to get the benefit, the best benefit for the river. Mm -hmm. Duncan, I wonder, maybe it may not be obvious to people watching this just exactly why somebody involved with salmon fishing might be interested in the dueling of the A9 and the effect that that would have on, on salmon. Could you, could you perhaps just say a few words about uh, the impact of things like major road projects and culverts and migrating fish and fry and all of that, these sort of issues? Yeah, well major, major infrastructure projects, they you know, create opportunities to fix things that happened in the past. So you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, people weren't maybe so aware of the problems with fish, so they maybe put a pipe in that fish couldn't access. But also we do spend a lot of time working with these developers very closely to mitigate against you know, pollution events, maybe uh, likes of taking invasive non-natives into the catchment on tracks of diggers, just little things like that. So you're looking, looking through their method statements, but everything relates, so any, anything that flows into the River Spey, that, or could flow into the river, river Spey, we try to get involved with. So, you know, even, you know, making sure that all these developers have all their silt traps in place, so the, the, the spawning reds aren't getting choked up with silt and things like that for coming off these major works. And the other issue, of course, we're, we're facing these days is the, the increasing uh, growth of the wind farm community and we're not only on land but also we've got some offshore wind farms now which are of real concern to us because what they're doing is affecting the or possibly affecting the migration of the smolts as they leave the fresh water and going out into the feeding grounds in the North Atlantic. We don't yet know what the effect is of electromagnetic uh, influence on those fish. Does it, does it affect them? Does it upset the navigation? So a lot of work being done there and we're, we're, we're involved in a lot of that, Duncan is involved in a lot of that, monitoring of the effects of it, as of course is Brian Shaw, our biologist, who, who is a leading, um, a leading player in, in, in this field. And that's becoming a big issue for us, uh, wind farms. Uh, yeah, we also have wind farms in the upper catchment as well, and, and on the fringes as well. So, you know, all these big infrastructure pro uh, projects, you look at them as a, an opportunity. You know, there might be sources of funding through these things for, you know, to, to develop more research. I think we all have a very good understanding. Well, we, we, we think we've got a good understanding of what happens in the river itself. But when they go to see smolts are an unknown entity and uh, there's a lot more research to be, to be done there. Yeah. Climate's changing. For instance, last uh, December, the spay was 220% higher than normal for the whole of December. So just little things like that, you know, how do we mitigate about what's going to happen in the future? And climate is very interesting because the fish at sea, when they go to sea and feed, the, 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 the small fish that they feed on uh, tend to like very cold water, the sand eels, cape, and that sort of thing. The average North Atlantic temperature has increased by just over one centigrade degree. doesn't sound a lot to us, but it's a massive amount from an ecological perspective. And, and the effect of that in the Atlantic is to drive the bait fish or the food no, further north so that the, the smolts have an even further, longer distance to go and it's a more hazardous journey. So they, they, they struggle to get there and also struggle to get back. So, so, so the, we just don't understand yet the survivability of that. And that is a climate change effect. And that's something we need to understand more about. As Duncan touched on, the, 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 the migration path, we don't yet really understand. And it's really quite surprising that we don't 
uh, after so many years, but we are now beginning some serious work into trying to track the migration routes of these fish and the effect of various man-made structures such as oil rigs and oil wells and what have you on, on, uh, on the, the, the uh, smolts going to sea. Another factor, of course, is aquaculture. Now, people have tended to think that's just a West Coast problem. Well, it is a West Coast problem, of course, primarily. That's where the majority of the fish farms are. But there is now some suggestion that fish are coming around the top of, the, the, coming around the top of Scotland and are actually being affected by some of the fish farms that are now appearing around the Shetlands. And it's well known now that uh, sea lice are an increasing issue, and we know that sea lice tend to congregate around the, the estuaries of the rivers, uh, particularly, and they, of course, particularly affect the sea trout, which tend to stay closer inshore than the salmon and, and are, are affected by the sea lice more. But uh, sea lice around um, uh, fish farms around, around uh, the Shetland is becoming uh, something more important to us, and we're looking at it more and the effect of that on salmon that are coming to our east coast rivers. So it does have an effect. So these are things that we perhaps did know about but didn't really understand the, the impact of them and there's a lot of work going on with that. I think water abstraction generally is, is a big issue for us because with the focus now on renewable energy there is greater pressure on our catchment and people trying to take water away from the catchment to generate electricity which in itself is commendable, but we can't benefit from the one at the expense of the, the wild salmon. So there has to be a balance, and that's what we're trying to achieve. Uh, you know, we're not trying to ban these things or stop these things, but we just need to try and find We've a lost, reasonable uh, balance. We lose 49% of the upper spay before it even reaches Canusi with water abstraction. Yeah. So, you know, we've lost that water, either going west for, smolt, uh, uh, for smelting timber, uh, Smelting aluminium, alum aluminium, aluminium in yeah. Fort William, or yeah. you know, it's transferred south into the Tay system for uh, hydropower. You know, and if you remove 49% of a river, the river starts to you know adapt to being smaller. Mm. And when you do get significant events, the river doesn't function properly. So the river is actually getting smaller and smaller in the upper catchment because there's not enough water coming down the river to make the river function properly. I mean, the smaller the wetted area, the bigger reduction wetted area, the less juvenile fish that area can support. Then we have other issues like uh, man-made barriers. Uh, one that we're very focused on at the moment is Spay Dam, where we, we have some concerns that we're not finding uh, any sensible numbers of juvenile fish above the dam, which suggests to us that the dam is not allowing these fish to get past, the migratory fish to get past. And we're looking at the fish pass there, and the dam itself, thanks to a lot of pressure put on by the Spain board, over a number of years uh, has now been classified by SEPA as a, as a barrier to migratory fish. Now, that, that's quite interesting, but the actual impact of that is that under the European Water Framework Directive, there is a requirement to maintain what is known as good economic, uh, ecological potential. And SEPA have now, will now require the owners of the dam, which is Rio Tinto, to make sure that the fish pass is fit for purpose and that migrating fish can get up into the headwaters to spawn. And there, there's something like, I think it's around 19 kilometers of excellent habitat above the dam, which currently is not being used. So SEPA's initiative there, driven largely by the efforts of the Spay Board and, and particularly my predecessor, Alan Williams, who, who, who spearheaded this with Roger Knight, our director, I think has, has, um, has, has helped help this, uh, this change to come about and I think that will have a major effect on the river. One of the, uh, one of the major changes uh, over the last uh, 12, 18 months or so has been the Wild Fisheries Management Review. Now this was, uh, this was actually commissioned by Alex Salmon, the previous First Minister, when he opened the River Tay in January 2014. And uh, Mr. Salmon asked uh, Andrew Thin, the, who was chairman of Scottish National Heritage, asked him to conduct a review of wild fishery management practices throughout Scotland and to review those practices and comment on their suitability and applicability to salmon fishing and salmon river management today. Uh, initially, that caused quite a lot of un unrest because there was some concern that this was a politically driven issue and there was some underlying motive here that we were a little bit concerned about. Uh, Andrew Thin conducted this report very quickly over about uh, six months and he started in January 
and he reported in October to the, to the Scottish Government. He, he produced a report with 53 separate recommendations, a huge range of, of proposals uh, regarding the way fisheries ought to be managed into the 21st century and, and going forward. Uh, the Government responded to that and we, we had a, a consultation came out I think in May last year which asked 38 questions and uh, we spent most of last year uh, various subcommittees and, uh, discussing and debating our response to these issues and they introduced a very controversial issue such as the proposal regarding a license to kill salmon. Did, did we need to have a license to kill salmon to aid conservation? Uh, we talk, they talked about netting, uh, they talked about carcass tagging, there were all sorts of issues that were, came as something of a shock to us. Uh, we argued the case fairly robustly, particularly regarding uh, the license to kill, because the conservation uh, approach by most anglers, certainly on, on, on this river here, on the Spey, it, the, the attitude is tremendous. I mean, we have over 90% uh, of fish being returned, uh, the fish caught, so we, we couldn't see that there was any conservation benefit to be gained from licensing to kill, uh, creating a license to kill. In fact, we could see it as a positive problem because if we produced a license and the license was going to be based on a quota, which was going to be based on sustainability, the mechanism to establish that was not defined in the, in the consultation at all. But our concern was that, that if they establish a quota of X number of fish, that would become a target and that may, we may end up with actually more fish being killed than we had with voluntary conservation. Uh, catch and voluntary catch and release, which, which, which we've been operating for many, many years, as indeed had many other rivers in Scotland. So we argued that there was no real conservation benefit to be gained uh, from licensing the rod fishery, but we did argue, of course, that there was a significant conservation benefit to be gained if there was some control imposed on the net fishery. Now, the net fishery, which is a perfectly legal means of catching fish, and all of the nets will operate under her heritable rights, licenses they've had for generations in some cases. So there's no suggestion that the netsmen are doing anything illegal. It's just that what they're doing is that they are killing 100% of the fish we catch, or, the, the, or they catch, rather, whereas we're returning 94% in the case of the spay last year, uh, if you like, we are borrowing fish from the river and then putting them back. The netsmen kill 100% and those fish never go on to spawn. And that is the issue. And the netsmen didn't seem to be too well controlled at all. So we, we argued this aggressively with the government. And, I'm, and, and together with, with colleagues from other major rivers particularly, and other of us, uh, some of the smaller rivers as well, we made a very strong case to the government. And I'm very pleased to say that uh, the government listened to our arguments and they did in fact decide that there was not a case for licensing and instead they introduced a, a system of categorizing the rivers uh, one two or three and basically that uh, that was based on their conservation uh, history shall we say and those rivers which had a demonstrated history of meeting a target over the last five years were not required to do anything at all they were the category one rivers such as this one here the spay where the the return rate was such that uh, there was no the, the, there was nothing more could be done and the the number of fish that were being killed were well below the sustainable level on the uh, in in the river category two rivers were rivers where they were maintaining a reasonable level of conservation uh, and, and catch and release and sustainability but not as good as it could be and they were going to be asked to improve their conservation policy and the category three rivers were those who were unable to demonstrate that they had an adequate conservation policy at all and that has resulted in them having a 100% catch and release uh, law rule imposed on them and so th th this has all been going on all this year and the, the, this district fishery board and others have been very actively working to respond to this consultation which we did in the summer of this year and uh, and I please say just just last week uh, Roger Knight, the director, and uh, Duncan and myself, we attended a meeting in Pitlochry at Marine Science Scotland where the Minister, Dr MacLeod, introduced the draft legislation which was going to be laid before Parliament later on this year. And that was a, yet another consultation, but it was a consultation which was drafted in a way that suggested they had listened to what we were saying. And I think that is really quite impressive. 
And I think that what happened was as they continued through this, uh, this review following uh, Andrew Thin's report, I think they came to realize that the, the district salmon fishery boards and the way they had been managing the rivers over the last 150 years, in our case I think it's 163 years, was actually pretty good and we'd done a pretty reasonable job and that in fact we, they didn't really need to take it apart and rebuild it. That doesn't mean it can't be improved, it certainly can be improved and we're all playing our part in trying to influence the government's thinking on that and we'll continue to do that. So I'm reasonably comfortable now and I think most of us are that we are going to end up with a reasonably sensible reform of wild fisheries management in Scotland, which ultimately will, to be, will be to the benefit of, of, the, of the salmon, which of course is the prime aim of all that we do. And if we benefit the salmon, we of course also benefit the local economies. I mean, in the case of Speyside here, salmon fishing is probably worth somewhere around 12, 15 million pounds a year. And that's in a contribution to the Scottish economy generally of probably somewhere over 200 million a year. So ultimately, this is everybody benefits.